Good morning. Um, I don't think I have a video on this. No, you possibly haven't got a webcam on that machine. That's no. right. Sorry about that. Okay. No, no problem. Better for everybody else. Oh. <laughs> so, Robert, you gave us a really um, inspiring talk yesterday, a keynote talk at Coventry, uh, which we tweeted and we storified <laughs> and we captured through um, Echo 360 and we'll be sharing um, widely as well. But today you're going to focus our minds on the competences of the telecollaborative teacher. And, uh, and we're looking forward to hearing that. Um, can I just remind you if, you, if you've got questions, if you want to ask a question, um, we'll save the questions until the end of the session. But if you do want to ask a question, you can just type it into the text chat. Just put a Q, a letter Q in front of it. It will be easier for our moderators to find it. And then we can uh, open up for some questions at the end of the uh, presentation. Great, I can see you've downloaded your files. That's all good. Uh, Marina, Marina is vouching for you, Robert. <laughs> OK, I'm going to hand over to Robert now and uh, switch my mic off for a few minutes. OK, everybody, good morning. Um, this is a bit disconcerting because I can hear myself in my headphones. Uh, hang on a second. Sorry, it's driving me crazy hearing myself like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take off my headphones and just talking. Can you all hear me okay like that anyway? Yeah, okay. Right. Um, first of all, thank you very much to Teresa for inviting me to take part in this, in this event today. Um, as you, you, some of you know me already. You know that I come from Ireland, right, from the southwest of Ireland. But I, I work in the University of Leon in, in Spain. But I'm actually at the moment in Coventry. Well, actually, I'm, no, I'm in Warwick, which is very... I'm, I'm insulting somebody, maybe, or not by saying that I'm in Coventry. I'm in Warwick University, which is next to Coventry. And um, I, I'm here today. I've been working here with, um, with all the colleagues here, and I've had a great time. And I'm going to talk to you today about the, the competences of the telecollaborative teacher. OK? Um, let me explain what, what I'm going to do. I'm going to start off by saying, first of all, what is telecollaboration or online intercultural exchange? I know some of your names already, and I know some of you are already working on this. So you, you have to bear with me so just to make sure that everybody else knows what we're talking about. OK? Um, what I'm then going to do is I'm going to show you a very practical example of a telecollaborative exchange that has taken place um, over the past 12 months at university level. Uh, I'm going to do that because I want to talk about all the things that teachers that organize and run these exchanges need to be able to do. And I think one way is by reading the big long list of competences that I've shared with you in that PDF document. Um, but maybe the, a little bit more interesting way is to see a practical example of what happens, what goes on during an exchange. And then to think about, you know, how do I prepare myself to, to work in, these, in this kind of, of environment. Right? So at the end of that, we'll, we'll look then briefly at the, at the model of telecollaborative competences that I've come up with and talk about a little bit um, the INTENT project, which is a project I'm involved in, European Finance Project, which is all about integrating tele telecollaborative networks into university higher education and show you a little bit what the work we're doing there. Okay. So first of all, um, this slide tells you very briefly what is telecollaboration. Okay? This definition comes from 2003, and it, it says that telecollaboration is institutionalized, electronically mediated, intercultural communication under the guide of a language cultural teacher, or uh, expert or a teacher, for the purposes of foreign language learning and developing intercultural competence. Now, that's maybe a bit of a mouthful, but it touches on all the in important aspects of this. Basically, what we're talking about is bringing together uh, foreign language learners in different locations around the globe in online collaboration together, getting students that are learning different languages to work together using those languages and to learn about each other's cultures and to learn about the, the experience of working and collaborating online. Um, now, before I, shall I say, before I get stuck into this, um, could you, a couple of you maybe submit in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in our chat, okay? What, what have your experiences been of telecollaboration? How many people, for example, among you have actually run online intercultural exchanges between your, your learners and learners in other countries? Could I have, um, 
could I have some people's opinions about that? Well, Elena, I know you have. You've done some really, really interesting work, okay, that we've written about before. Simon and Clermont as well, yeah. Teresa, very good. Sarla in, in Australia, okay. Okay, so I can see that quite a few of you have done it. But also, of, of all the people present, maybe, um, maybe there's, there's plenty of you that haven't, okay? Um, and what about my second question? What benefits do you think it would have for your classes? Okay, if you, when you do these type of exchanges, what benefits can they have? Anybody have any opinions about that? So people mentioned staff, IT issues, about the staff not knowing how to use the technology, maybe. Okay, Heike is talking there about her Chinese-German exchange. Time zones can be a different... Well, yeah, it, it can be when, when, we go, when we go out of Europe, definitely, yes. I barely mentioned that, sorry. Okay. Elena says it's very hard to set it up, and that's very true, but the authentic learning and the authentic materials that come out of it can be very interesting. Okay. All right. Lots and lots of ideas pouring in there. Students feel they are getting a real experience of Sarah. Okay. And Elena says it's very exciting. It is. When it works, Elena, it is very, very exciting. Okay. All right. Now, thank you for that. I'm going to move on. Okay. Um, I just want to, to say that this thing has this type of activity, joining your classes together with classes in other parts of the globe and getting them to collaborate and work together, uh, has been going on now for maybe about 20 years, okay? And th there's a good body of literature now growing up about, you know, the, the benefits of this and, and justifying its use, okay? Because very often um, some teachers among you will have found that in your departments you have to justify this type of work. And if you do, there is plenty of work, and you see that in the slide in front of you, that, that show that, oh, I've suddenly my... There we go. Why is that? You change your slide. Ron. Okay, I'm going to click Ron. Okay, I'm back again. No interest. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so so the, there's plenty of literature that justifies the benefits, that it, it can help develop learner autonomy, linguistic competence, intercultural competence, students' online literacy skills, Okay, and it is also very valuable as a tool for in, in informal and independent learning. Okay, so uh, of course all of this means is that telecollaboration can, when applied properly and when organized properly, contribute to these. It doesn't mean that telecollaboration will automatically develop these things. Okay, okay. I'm now clicking on one to see if this disappears. Okay, okay, sorry about that again, I'm sorry. Now, so let's move on. I'm going to tell you this morning about a uh, an exchange that I was involved in with, with Marina, who's sitting across the right way from me here today in Warwick. Um, this is an exchange that brought together classes, university classes, in Spain, the UK, Germany, and Israel. Okay. Um, uh, my my group or a group of first year foreign language of English as a foreign language learners in University of Leon. Okay. Then we had uh, the University of Coventry, with about 40 students there. In Koblenz, there we had a group of business and English, stu uh, English studies students, um, about 100 of them, I think. And we also had a very big number, I think about 50 or 60 students studying at, at Tel Aviv University in, in, in Israel. Okay, so they're roughly, roughly, maybe I'm overestimating there, there. It was 100, yeah, yeah, I'm not too sure now with the UK side, so originally it was 100, but it might have dropped down a little bit. Okay, the exchange took took place, Simon says, ah, Koblenz, that's interesting, with Ellen Rana. Yes, exactly, Simon, yeah, yeah, that's exactly the lady that was involved, yeah. Um, and they, it took place between late October and mid-December 2012, so you see automatically this, this exchange was quite short. And these exchanges on university level tend to be quite short sometimes because the window of opportunity where all the university groups are, are available to work together can be quite short between when courses begin, when courses end, um, when there are holidays, when there are exam times and things like that. What tools do we use? Well, we, all, of, all of the course, all of the exchange was located on a Moodle, okay, a Moodle platform that I imagine most of you are familiar with. And in there we had, um, we would post all our 
our messages and our texts and things like that. And we also used Blogger. Um, uh, asynchronous ask IK. Uh, yes, it was asynchronous IK. I'm going, I'm going to show you the different tasks in a, few, in a second now, and you'll see that the tasks were necessarily um, asynchronous. Okay. So, what were the tasks? Well, the first one is that the students were asked to create a blog to present different aspects of their local culture, and then they were asked to read the blogs created by the other by the other groups and to um, to provide feedback with them, on them. Okay, here you can see some screenshots from uh, one of the Tel Aviv blogs, from one of the Koblenz blogs, and one from uh, one of the the Leon Spanish blogs. Okay, so this is it took us about um, a month to get this done between the classes starting at different uh, dates and things like that, and then getting the students to create quite detailed blogs, and then they would post feedback to each other in Moodle. All right. The second task, which you can see an example of in front of you here was group interviews. We had so many students, right? we had been between three and four hundred students altogether in this exchange. So what we decided was to break them into groups, okay, so, and there was twelve different discussion groups set up and students were assigned one of these groups. So you had about um, five or six students from each of the local universities working together in smaller, smaller groups. And there they had to interview each other on specific cross-cultural themes that they agreed on. The one you can see here was weddings, okay, this group discussed the idea of weddings in different cultures, okay, and they would ask what, um, a set of questions at the outset about, about, that specific quest, about that specific topic, and then students from each of the four different universities would answer those questions um, in respect to their own culture, okay. And then, the, the third task then was depending on the, on the university. Um, it's very important that these exchanges that students are somehow evaluated or receive some sort of credit for their work. And for example, in Leon, what we did was we asked them to base basing themselves on their blogs and on their uh, interviews to write up an essay reflecting on what they had learned from the exchange, and also to carry out a class presentation summing up what they had um, what what they had learned and what they had gotten from the exchange. And this is really, really interesting because what you realize is, and especially in the presentations, is that there was so much interaction going on, there were so many students working this project, that all of the students learned different things and got different um, things out of it, shall we say. Okay, so that was really, really interesting. Okay, now, so that was, that if you like, is, this, is an example of a pretty basic, a pretty short, simple online exchange, okay, where there's nothing too complex, there's no synchronous um, interaction between the students taking place and things like that. But I'd like you to think for a minute and, and tell me, what are the particular skills and attitudes which a teacher will need to take part in such an exchange, okay? In other words, what makes a telecollaborative teacher different to other call teachers, so other teachers that are using technologies in their classes. Does anybody have any ideas about this? You know, what makes a telecollaborative teacher different? Risk taker, says somebody. Trust, trust, trust and patience, this is somebody as well. Um, being flexible, being an intercultural moderator. Let's go back for a second to um, to the lady, who was it? Sylvia Taylor. Sylvia, could you tell us a little bit, why do you say trust and patience? I think it's very interesting. Creative, um, being an intercultural moder mediator, being flexible. Sylvia, would you like to use your mic or do you want to type into the text chat? Sylvia says, you have to rely on others to help you carry out the task. Okay, that's very, very true. Yeah, yeah. That is, is definitely a, um, an, an issue that, um, and like many other tasks that you would do on, um, in your foreign language classroom, especially even when you're using uh, computers, in telecollaboration you are not working alone. You are working with other teachers who have their own context, their own demands, their own interests, and their own ways of doing things. And you are trying to combine all of these so that the same activity works for your class and for theirs. Okay. Um, yes, everyone, you've come up with the word that I'm not even going to begin to try and put <laughs> I love it. Cyber pragmatically competent. 
Okay, well done. Thank you for doing that. Okay. So now, uh, I'm going to move on now, and I'm going to show you a few, shall we say, critical incidents. Okay, critical incident sounds awful, doesn't it? It sounds like a car crash or something, but I don't mean that. I mean, certainly it's things that came up during the exchange that, um, shall we say, um, you know, could showed that the exchange wasn't working out properly in some ways, or things that could go wrong. Okay, and I'm just trying to show you, you know, what a telecollaborative teacher has to deal with, right? Okay, the, the first one is, shall we say, a pretty obvious one, okay? And uh, the first one um, comes from, uh, is an email sent to me by one of the teachers, and she says, hi everyone, uh, or not, not to me, but to everybody. Task one is going very well with my students who are really getting into it. However, just to let you know, for the second week running, we have experienced problems with the Moodle site, which just crashes at the beginning of our session. This is a real problem as we can't continue and students get frustrated. So th there's an issue here. Oh, there's obviously the technical issue as, as usual, okay? But um, in telecollaboration, this is almost doubled because what you're doing is um, you're not only are your students not able to participate, but if your students don't participate, and speaking of technical problems, I've got something else on my screen again now. Let's see what this is. Okay, it's gone. Okay. Um, not only um, are you, your, your students unable to participate due to technical problems, but also if the students in the other countries are left waiting for your students to write. Okay, so there's, you know, it, it, technical problems on one side will bring down the participation from everybody. Okay. Now, that's the first um, critical incident. Here's the second one. All right, get this. This is an email from the Israeli teacher. Uh, who wrote when the Israeli-Palestinian conflict broke out? You remember that last year, around October, there was the, um, there was a lot, an awful lot of um, tension between Israel and Palestine. And actually, the students in Tel Aviv they were actually writing to us at some stages from, onto the Moodle, saying we can hear rockets falling on our campus this morning as we write. Okay, so this is you know bringing something, bringing the conflict, very, making it very real to people in Europe. Anyway. The Israeli teacher wrote this to me. She said, interestingly, yesterday I had to deal with a few upset students in a blog group who were responding to a comment from Germany regarding the war situation, which they felt was insensitive. And this is the comment that they were referring to, okay? I can understand that the rockets are very scary. I'm very glad that we are in Germany, that we in Germany don't have war like you. I think Israel isn't alone in charge of this conflict. But can you understand the people in Gaza? Is it okay to keep these people there like in prison? Why isn't it possible, or why is it so complicated to find a solution for all the people in your re in your region? Okay, so you can see what is happening here is that the German students are, are challenging, shall we say, the Israeli students to justify their own government's behavior and things like that. Now, this is a real tough intercultural situation here. What, what should the teacher in Israel do? In Israel, do should she tell her students to respond, to challenge the student, to to argue it out? Should it be avoided? I mean, these are, you know, when you, when you engage with students in telecollaborative um, collaboration, all of a sudden the, the political and social aspects of their countries are often brought into question and they are forced to defend, shall we say, or explain aspects of their country that they would have never have done so before. Now, some people would argue that this is a benefit of telecollaboration because it's getting students ready for going abroad. It's getting students ready for talking and interacting with people from other cultures. However, is this something that you want brought into your classroom? Are you willing to deal with these things? All right, so this is, you know, one of the, the both the benefits and the challenges of telecollaboration. Um, speaking of in, intercultural incidents, I want you to have a look at the next two um, screenshots. The first, both of them come from blog pages that my students were making for uh, for the others, okay. Um, the first one is um, a blog made by three of my students. You can see the pictures of them there, and I saw them working on the in the lab on this blog one day. And uh, have a look closely at the three pictures that they, they that they use to present themselves. Okay, does anything jump out at you? Does anything catch your attention there? Drinking, says Sylvia. Well, well spotted, yeah, yeah. And I don't know about you, but I'm not too comfortable about students of my university or my institution presenting themselves in an international c in context to other universities and to other students with this uh, this image. Yeah. Well, yeah. Whether it's sexy or not, I don't know. I was more worried about the the, the drinking aspect of it. 
And uh, you know, I, I said, you know, maybe this. In, I said, you're dealing here now with people you don't know. You don't you know what their attitudes to alcohol consumption is. I said, maybe you should be a little bit more careful with the way you present yourself. And when I, when I did call their attention to this, they, they did agree. You know, and this is something that you can show in your whole class and say, now, what do the rest of you think about this? Do you think this is an appropriate way for us to be presenting ourselves to the rest of the world? All right. Or just do soft drinks, yeah, but I, I, I think I can assure you that they weren't soft drinks. Anyway. Um, and another one. Rosario says they are presenting themselves as cool. Yes, they are, and, and but as, uh, I think they still could do that without y using alcohol in it. I don't know. That's that was my take on it anyway. And the second one, this is even a, maybe a more subtle one. Okay, and maybe um, this uh, this is uh, um, Leon is 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 on the way to the Camino de Santiago. Okay, which is this beautiful pilgrim's path all the way to Santiago. And Santiago, some of you may know, is Saint James. And St. James is commonly known in old Spanish culture as El Matamoros, okay, the, the Moor killer. Okay, and here you see him as being part of the Reconquista, of the reconquest of Spain, crushing the Moors. Okay? And in one of the blogs, uh, here you have Spanish students talking about their local history and stuff like that, and presenting him uh, in this way, okay, presenting this picture. Okay. Marina says, uh, writes in the text, 30% of students in Coventry are Muslim. And I can assure you in Tel Aviv, there's a bigger percentage of Muslims in the, in the, in the Israeli class as well. And I just, uh, I wanted them not to present this picture out of context. Okay, we're not going to say, please avoid all historical con context here at the risk of insulting people. But what I did tell them to do is that if they're going to use a picture like that, they need to explain the, the, the context of it. And to, to highlight that this isn't something that um, you know that is still admired today, shall we say, this approach to things. Right? So these are, shall we say, things that simple things, you know, things that students in Leon, because they are not used to intercultural communication, they are not used to ha mixing with people from other cultures, then they are not used to these type of things. And you, you as a teacher, your responsibility here is to watch out, call their attention to these things, and talk it through with them. You know? Finally, one more. Okay, um, yeah, this is an email from one of the coordinating teachers explaining the lack of participation from her students. Um, one of the teachers wrote to me: "Some of my colleagues have not been very supportive of this initiative of the telecollaborative exchange." I was speaking to another teacher who does telecollaboration about this earlier today, and she told me it has happened to her as well on some telecollaborative projects. Okay, um, telecollaboration. Is, a, is an activity that has an effect not only on your class and on your students, but also on your department. It is something that very often goes outside of the classroom. And uh, I think you need to aware when you get into one of these projects, they can, all, they can have political consequences, they can have um, consequences on a, on a department level. And it's very important for a teacher who is starting off in these projects to make uh, his, head of the, his or her head of department aware of what, is, of what they're doing and of how they're doing it and things like that. This is, shall we say, political and well, maybe even sometimes legal consequences, okay? So this isn't your average new call activity. This is um, a serious activity that has very, very great potential for learning. But it, bring, it, it requires often a change of culture in the way university departments work, okay? Simon calls it boundary breaking. It does, yeah. When it when it works properly, it does. Simon, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Okay. So these are basically um, these are basically the, the examples I wanted to draw from that exchange. Okay. And very quickly, I'd like you maybe, if you can, to maybe scribble down in our in our chat um, what differentiates the telecollaborative competence from traditional online competence for foreign language teachers. Okay. After seeing these things, well, you know what, what jumps to your mind? Diplomacy, so Sarah. The, this diplomacy and the willingness to be constantly negotiating, Sarah. I think is very important to say. Netiquette, yeah, yeah. Netiquette not only for your students but also for you yourselves as teachers, because you've got to explain constantly to your teachers, what, to the other partners, what's going on here. And a willingness, yeah. A willingness to compromise, yeah, yeah. A willingness to compromise, and um, cultural sensitivity, reflexivity, yeah. 
there's so many things that you know the skills and competences that you as a teacher will develop I think when you get involved in these type of, of tasks okay for Coventry Mary says it is internationally focused which adds to the collaboration okay yeah I, I think telecollaboration can form a very important part of any internationalization policy at a university if your university is talking internationalization well, don't be afraid to sell them this as one very uh, low cost way of getting involved in, in collaboration. Teresa, how am I doing for time? I don't want to, to go on too long, but I want to get to finish it up. Yeah, you're okay to carry on um, to to finish your slides, Rob. Please do carry on. I think we're really interested in, and enjoying the information that you're giving us here. But have I gone over my time? Um, you're just coming up to uh, eleven. 13, you've got 15 minutes left. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Okay. Right. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to highlight, I think, three or four things that differentiate your average teacher, average call teacher to, to uh, a telecollaborative teacher. Okay? Uh, first of all, telecollaboration is inherently intercultural, okay? both in practice and its underlying pedagogical principles. If you don't believe in intercultural competence and if you don't believe in developing intercultural standing, understanding is a basic part of foreign language education, you are not likely to do this type of thing. Okay? The second thing is, telecollaborative teacher is not alone. There's two, or in our case, in this case, four teachers working together with very different cultural and institutional contexts. And this requires the teacher to keenly refine their skills, attitudes of intercultural competence. You have to be constantly taking into account that the people you are working with have their own needs, their own um, demands, and you are trying to find a successful outcome of that. So it's in the same way that the students are, are collaborating together online, so are you and the other teachers. Telecollaboration number three tends to be a long-term complex activity which permeates the whole foreign language course. What do I mean? That mean uh, I mean that the, the, the themes, the tasks, everything that you are doing in, in the telecollaborative exchange should be also talked about and worked on in your normal face-to-face -face classes with your students. It, it can't be something that's just added on or stuck on at the end. Right? And it, as we have just seen, it, has, it affects colleagues. And, and course requirements as well. You know, you, you've got to try, if students are going to spend hours and hours working on these long pro projects, they require, they deserve recognition and credit for their work. So that has to appear in your syllabus, in your, your, your course guides. And also your colleagues should be aware of this and they should be aware of what you're doing and, you know, what can come out of these exchanges. And finally, in telecollaborative setups, teachers need to be able to react quickly to emerging problems, issues and new learning opportunities. Very often in a telecollaborative exchange, a teacher doesn't know what's he going to be talking about the next day in class because it all depends on what somebody would have written that afternoon in a Moodle platform. And that can be uh, a bit tiring, a bit ner nerve-wracking sometimes, but it's also very, very exciting. And it makes language learning very real because you're not using the same text you did 10 years ago. You are using as the text for your learning, the, the messages, the blogs that are being created as we speak by native speakers and by other non-native speakers. Okay, so so these I think are the, the big differences. Okay, now I'm not going to sit down and uh, now and, and read down through this very long list of competences that you have in your PDF file. I let you, if you're interested in this, please feel free to to have a read of them on your own. Um, you'll also I can also provide you with a copy of the article where I explain how I came up with these competences. The, the model of competences was basically made up by um, three rounds of consultation with approximately 80 telecollaborative teachers from all over the world. I came up with a first draft of what I thought were the, the different competences of the, of the telecollaborative teacher based on, on, on what was written in the literature. And I sent it three different times to 80 different teachers from primary, secondary, university education that were all working in telecollaboration. And I asked them to edit them, to get rid of the ones that were relevant, to add new ones. And after three rounds of doing this, the, the, the model of telecollaborative competence for teachers, which you see in front of you, was, was arrived at. Okay? It has four different sections. Organizational competences, so how to organize and set up the exchange. Uh, on the second page, you'll see pedagogical competences, so how to design tasks, how to, to design assessment. Digital competences. 
exactly how to choose the right tools, how to know how these tools, whether you know how these tools work or not. And finally, the, maybe the, the controversial part of it, if you like, is the attitudes and beliefs. So what attitudes does a telecollaborative teacher normally have or should be developing? Okay? And what I'm working on next is trying basically to um, to, to, to see how I can take this very big long list and make it practical for teacher training purposes, if we can make it into a portfolio or I don't know if other people have other suggestions about how this assessment can best be used for teacher training. Okay. Now, I'm going to go on and I'm going to show you very quickly before I finish um, some of the work related to this. Okay, the, the intent project is a project f funded by the European uh, Commission, uh, the Lifelong Learning Programme. And what we're doing is we're trying to help integrate this type of activity in universities across, across Europe. Um, we've, pulled, we've brought out a report, which is a major survey of telecollaboration all around Europe, which you can find online in the Intent website. We've carried out training workshops in Italy, France, and, Polish, and Poland to date. And there's a UK workshop at, by, organized by the Open University taking place in London, not, at, not in Milton Keynes, but in London on the 18th of October and it's still, um, there are still places that and that's free to attend. So if you want to register for that, you can also find the registration form on the Intent Project homepage. Um, we've made a platform which I'm, which I'm going to show you now where teachers can find partner classes. And finally, we're having a, a hopefully a big international conference on telecollaboration at my home university, the University of Leon, from the 12th to the 14th of February next year. Uh, and that is also free to attend as, it, as we have funding from the European Commission. Okay, so if you're interested in coming to this, please do. Okay. Um, will the Open University Workshop be online too? I don't think so, I'm afraid, Angela. No, I'm afraid not. No, no. Um, so finally, what I would ask you to do is, if you're interested in learning more about this, about in learning about telecollaboration and getting involved, please join us on our Unicollaboration website. There's the address in front of you there. Uh, the Unit Collaboration website is very simply a place for finding out uh, where um, teachers can, can find partner classes, where you can do tasks, where, where you can read about tasks, when you read about training and everything, okay? We've got um, different tasks. In the classes section, we have different teachers who are looking for partner classes across the world. In the task section, we have lots of different tasks. In the training section, uh, in the training section, We've got sample projects that you can read about and lots of videos you can watch and listen to. Okay, so if you're interested in learning more about this, please come and join us. I'll show you the web page again. It's unicollaboration.eu. Unicollaboration with a dash or without, without a dash as well, I think it works. Okay, um, okay I'm going I'm to stop there. I'm running out of steam and I've run out of water as well. So <laughs> I'd like now if anybody has any comments or questions or any reactions, please go ahead and let me know. I'll try and respond. I'm going to put Thanks. my headphones back on as well. Thanks very much, Rob, and that's, that's brilliant. That's given us a really in-depth um, insight into telecollaboration um, and, and the skills that we need. And I'm sure we're going to have lots and lots uh, more to, uh, uh, to discuss during the day. You have got some uh, uh, emoticons underneath your name, so if you want to give uh, some applause, you can choose that from the emoticons if you wish to do so. Um, and please, if you have any questions for Rob, just put Q in front of your question and type it into the text chat and we'll start to collect them. Yes, we're seeing all sorts of emoticons being used now, that's great. Um, we'll start to collect those ideas together. I'm going to um, put the links that you've put in your presentation, Rob, out into Twitter under the Quill hashtag and I'll also put them um, through into the Google Plus community which is uh, filling up. So those of you who've not joined, if you just click through to um, Google Plus community and find the Quill community, C-W-I-L, um, you'll be able to see various things that we've shared throughout the day, including some of the coffee break photos for our virtual coffee earlier on. Um, so please feel free to, uh, to share your pictures and tell us more about your experiences through that Quill community, which obviously will be ongoing beyond today. Um, so we've got a first question coming in from Heike. 
uh, for you, Rob. Did you notice um, a marking difference in technical, uh, a marked difference, I think you, you're saying, in technical skills hampering telecollaboration? So this is, this is very much where I, where most of my work tends to be, which is the, the barriers, the technical barriers, as well as the emotionally effective barriers, the technical barriers to adoption of telecollaboration, particularly by tutors. Um, so, Rob, I don't know if you want to come back on that. Okay. Um, I don't think technical um, skills were, was an issue, Heike. We, I asked them to create the blogs. We all asked them to create blogs using Blogger. And certainly in Lyon, that wasn't an issue. They were able to do that, and they learned how to use Blogger in, in a question of minutes. And they ended up making much nicer blogs than I've ever made after years of, of playing with it. And, and Moodle is also, I think, quite a... A basic, simple, uh, quite a simple tool for any for any young student to work with. Um, that was a, at least my my experience. I don't know about the other universities. I remember the colleague in Israel being worried about using Blogger with her students, but they too presented very very nice blogs. Yeah, so I think perhaps what we're saying here is that when you're setting up a telecollaboration, you need to analyze the nature of the tools that you wish to use and make sure that people are comfortable with those and perhaps provide support um, for people. So if you've chosen your, blog, your, um, your tools and the means of communication um, around where you're, the teachers you're working with are, are comfortable, um, then you should be okay. We have a question from Rosario, and I think she makes a really good point, and I'm sure other people, particularly if you're not familiar with this environment, will have found. This is quite challenging, isn't it? This, this, is, this is pretty intense, working in a virtual classroom with lots of things to watch. You've got your emoticons ticking away, you've got text chat, and perhaps private messages coming in and out as well. Um, if you're like me as well, you've got four or five windows open, you're keeping an eye on Twitter, you're keeping an eye on the Google Plus community. Um, yes, it's challenging. We're really multi-skilling. How, how have you found how have you found that, um, Robert, in your context as well? Uh, I think we might just need you to press your talk button, Rob. Sorry, sorry. There's my technical okay. confidence. That's um, great. No, we what all I was do it saying is that it's quite tiring. You know, t talking and trying to watch the chat at the same time, and especially when lots of people are using the chat at the same time, it is. Um, it can get very confusing. Yeah, very overcoming. Yeah. Yeah. So this, what we're doing really at the moment is at the cutting edge of of tele collaboration. We're doing a synchronous. We're in a synchronous environment. Probably got multiple um, different ways of accessing. I can see some people are on tablets and uh, phones, and others are on computers. Uh, there's a lot going on, and it is quite an intense experience. Um, but it does improve with time. Uh, let's come back to another question we've got here. Um, how did you select partners? So, Rob, this is perhaps going back to uni collaboration EU and, and the uh, benefits of uh, signing up for that uh, website. And perhaps you could tell us, just sort of recap a little bit about what, what's happening there. Okay. Um, the, I found the, I came into contact with these three different partners by po posting on a mailing list on the Eurocall mailing list a request for partners. And several people answered, and it was a simply a question of, of exchanging a few ma emails with people and seeing if what they wanted to do, and if, Eurocall, yes, the Eurocall mailing list, yeah, and seeing what they were interested in doing and if what I wanted to do more or less coincided with them, and it kind of it, it narrowed itself down there bit by bit to 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 three people, yeah. So, but nowadays you don't have to go into the Eurocall mailing list to do that. All you have to do is go to Uni Collaboration, and there you will put up your class request, okay? And there people will read it and answer you. Yeah, I think that I, my my situation with Simon, who's also in the room at the moment, was a sort of serendipitous um, conversation via a blog on Steve Wheeler's blog. It happened to be uh, that's how we met. But since then, and since the collaboration has been growing, we're increasingly pointing other teachers who are interested to uh, to uni collaboration, and uh, we've uploaded our own um, project onto there. So you can actually search institutions who are looking for collaborators and look for tasks. It's a, it's a brilliant database of um, uh, supporting to support staff 
in the uh, uni collaboration, um, in the road, road to tele collaboration. Uh, the website's been live since around February. It followed the uh, publication of the intent report. Um, and yeah, I think Heike, you'll enjoy you'll enjoy uh, taking a look through the the things on there. And we have another question from Young here. Quite a lot of activities are undergoing um, outside classes. I'd like to know what kind of tasks are taking place in class between teachers and students. So um, I can only speak, of course, for Leon, OK, because I wasn't inside the other classrooms. But for example, before making the blog, students are asked to brainstorm you know, you know, what, how, what aspects of their local culture are they going to present, how they are going to present it. They plan their projects in these classrooms because some of them for their blogs actually went out and made videos of different aspects of their town and things like that. So an awful lot of work went into that. And then when the project was underway, um, every class will begin with a review of the, of the Moodle platforms and the, the different forums that were going on there and maybe picking out some interesting um, discussions because there's so many discussions going on that y you as a teacher, you have to stay on top of them and point out to the students the ones that are worth investigating and worth exploring. Okay, so Leanne, that's, that takes up an awful lot of time. And then, of course, the class presentations at the end and discussing feedback, feedback on their essays that they'd written about the, the project. So that, that was basically it. Okay, we're going to, um, I think, hello, we seem to be whizzing through the slides at the moment. I think we're, let's just come back to, to your slide here. Um, the, we have, all oh, right, okay, Rosario, what would be an optimum time to dedicate to a telecollaborative task taking into consideration the intensity of the experience? I think, Rosario, you're talking about a, um, a, a synchronous meetup such as what we're doing today. Um, certainly my experience is, you know, for synchronous meetings, an hour is, is plenty. But uh, it depends how, how engaged people are and, you know, it can be surprising. Um, the synchronous is valuable, um, but you do need reliable tools. You do need things that, that will work and uh, things that won't cause huge amounts of problems, um, which is certainly the area I've been researching in quite, uh, quite a lot. So we're coming up to 11.30. Um, we're going to move on during the day, but obviously what I'm, what I'm most keen to do during the online day today is to give you an experience of telecollaboration at its most extreme. Um, thank you ever so much, Rob, for, for your presentation. I think it's been very, very interesting and stimulating, and it's really set the tone and given us a lot of um, meat to look at and to work on. Um, I'd, I'd, Sarah, I'm just going to see if I can find your mic, if you're still with us, because I would like to invite you just to say hello to everybody. Um, let's just enable a mic for you. Sarah, I know it's, I know it's very late um, out in Australia there, but Sarah has published a, an excellent book on um, telecollaboration for um, language teaching. And Sarah, I'd love it if you could perhaps just briefly tell us a little bit about that before we move on to the um, the other um, intent report project that we're going to talk about today. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? We can. We can hear you perfectly. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for such a wonderful and inspirational presentation there, Robert. I really enjoyed it. And thank you very much, Teresa, for everything you've done to to organise these sessions and uh, I'm just so grateful to be a part of it, it was fantastic. And uh, thanks also for the lovely introduction to uh, my book which, uh, I mean in some ways it, it is about telecollaboration, it is about uh, students communicating with other students but I think the perhaps small point of difference is that it's uh, really about what students do behind our back, so to speak, um, the kinds of really interesting and um, exciting communication that students are getting up to with participants from um, sometimes it's other universities, sometimes it's 
former exchange students that they've hosted or families that they stayed with or um, people that they've met on online forums, all sorts of different contacts. So I've been probing those kinds of relationships that uh, students at, at uh, a university in Australia had with uh, students and uh, other people, um, sometimes colleagues and so forth in Japan. And uh, I'll, I'll post a, a link to the book there. Thanks for asking, Marina. I'll, uh, I'll send one. Um, the name of the book is Online Communication in a Second Language. So hopefully it might be of uh, interest to some people. Thank you so much for this opportunity to introduce it to you. And if there are any questions, I'd love to take them. I've done a spectacularly poor job of talking tonight, I'm afraid, but uh, I hope you'll forgive my <laughs> slightly muddled and confused brain after a day full of uh, marking exams for the last 12 hours, so oh <laughs> no my apologies goodness. for that. No, sorry for putting you on the spot there, Sarah. I've just put the link into your, to your book. Um, and I know it will be particularly of interest to uh, Japanese language teachers, but it's a, it's a great book and uh, anybody interested in these sorts of uh, activities, you really should be getting your, your university library to stock it um, and uh, share the, the, the increasing body of knowledge around um, informal learning opportunities. It is important to, to, show, um, to show people just how much students are doing beyond our classrooms to support their learning. Um, they're already engaged in a lot of these types of activities. Um, so yeah, it, it, it sort of brings, us, brings it home to us perhaps a little bit more that, uh, that in fact, although we may think we're cutting edge, often we're still um, behind the curve really on this.